Well, here we go. It's about yeah, 10 to midnight. <laughs> Saturday. What's today? Love. Today is the 11th, April 11, and um, this will be the last one from Kigali. Uh, it, it is. So that cuts down on some of the echo. Um, full day. A good day, though. You know, this afternoon met with the um, widow of one of the two men who worked so faithfully with me during the genocide, Dawson. Um, he was ex-military commando before the genocide even. He left the military, trainer guy, and uh, worked for me at ADRA, and a wonderful man of integrity. Knew how to weld, and he actually uh, came. We set up a welding shop. He was the chief of the welding shop. and. Uh, really knew how to quietly negotiate his way through the roadblocks. A lot of times people just think about me going through the roadblocks alone and rarely was I alone. I mean, there are a few times, but pretty rare. And uh, some days I'd have my friend Gasequa with me. Other days I'd have Dawson with me. These two men were just um, invaluable during this time. And yeah, his quiet, soft-spoken and his deep trust in God, he was um, a very incredible man. A year after the genocide, tragically, he lost his life in a car accident. But as I met with his widow today, we'll have to stick that picture on. Um, boy, I haven't stuck a bunch, any pictures yet, I don't think, on the website. That'll probably happen when we get home here in the next couple of days. Um, but uh, it was very nice to meet with her and one of her children. And um, she's doing well. She works at a dental clinic and, and uh, doing well. Her oldest son is the one that we've been helping get through university so that he can um, support the family. Also this afternoon, a couple old friends, a businessman here in Kigali, Josue came by, and John, and uh, nice to sit and visit with them. And, and he was, uh, he's a real creative entrepreneur type guy here. And uh, he's brought in a stone cutting machine for cutting lava stones so you lay down yard bricks for landscaping and stuff. Uh, great, great guy. But this evening, um, you know, it's getting late. I got back to the to the place where the hotel, where the government's been putting us up, and um, and that was, of course, after Teresa and I went out to dinner with the Minister of Information, Louise Mushiki Wabo, and her husband Norman, a very very gracious couple. If it wasn't for Louise, I'm I'm guessing we might not have been here this time. Um, she's the one who really made all the arrangements, and is just so graciously cared for all of our needs and uh, been so incredibly supportive and appreciative. Many families today, including hers, were having memorial services. Um, very hard time going back to the burial sites and stuff. As in many places, they're still discovering those who were, who were carelessly thrown down toilets and pits. And I hate to even say the word so kind of easily because it's so tragic. In fact, I'll make another blog about one of the exhumation sites we are coming on here 15 years later. We'll do that as a subject of another blog. But um, after a heavy day like that, she mentioned having a sense of, you know, just uh, peace, which, which is wonderful. You just pray and hope that many people, even though there's still so many unanswered questions and things, um, you just pray that people begin to get some sense of peace and as we continue to journey through it. But it's this journey and through it that um, that really struck me this evening. As I got back, there's another phone number, the, the cleaning gal at the union office, Perusi. Um, unfortunately, she had come and waited for me. I didn't know she was coming and she was gone. I called, talked to her for a while on the phone. And it's probably 10.30 or something and the phone in the room rings here again. Another guy down at the desk. and. Uh, the son of one of our former ADRA workers who was hiding in the city during the genocide. And I went down to talk to him in the cool evening breeze. Really wanted to shoot you some footage from outside, but we'll see, you'll see enough. I uh, wanted to do one of these blogs with the beautiful background instead of this. But anyway, um, as I went down in the beautiful, cool, fresh evening air, it's always like that in Rwanda, um, met this young man found out later, 34 years old, an IT specialist. He actually got his training in Toronto, but he's a 17-year-old kid at the time of the genocide. He and his mom and siblings are down south. Um, boy, I'm not exactly sure which city. They might have been somewhere in the direction of Gitarama when the genocide hit. 
and they fled. Their dad was here working in the city. Dad had to hide Thomas um, in Yamirambo. And during the genocide, I would drop off either Dawson or Gasequa, one of those two men in a certain neighborhood, and they would kind of nonchalantly make their way through the neighborhood and get to the hiding place and get money to Thomas, I, I imagine, to the people who were helping to hide Thomas. And then they would work their way back out to Main Street, and I'd have a rendezvous point where they'd meet up with them. And this young man now, you know, at 17, he, he's uh, very well-spoken, uh, very just warm as you greeted him, just a sense of warmth. And um, he said to me, I don't, I don't want to take a lot of time, of your time, but I have a question, you know. He'd, he'd asked first about my work, a little bit what I was doing and, and things like that. And then uh, very graciously, you know, he says, I don't take a I said, no, it's fine, go ahead. He says, you know, I was, I was 17 at the time. And um, I was here. And, and I don't understand. How do people in America understand? And I, I said, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I can't say that when I'm done talking with them about what happened here, they do understand. But one thing I hope is that, that the simple understanding they had before, which is so often incorrect, this simple understanding that it says, oh, Hutu people hated Tutsi people and they started killing each other, that that simple understanding will be broken, shattered, and that they will begin this journey searching for a new, more correct, and more um, useful for the future understanding. None of us understand it, but we're really in trouble when we think we do, and we settle for these, um, these shallow and incorrect explanations. I used to kind of get a little frustrated. I shouldn't say frustrated, but it kind of was like, why do they do this at facing history in ourselves? when I first started working with them a few years ago, because they said, you know, we work to complicate the understanding of students. Complicate their understanding. <laughs> Somehow, it was a phrase sort of like that, serious, not much different than that. And I'm like, you know, I like to simplify things. I like to, I think, simplify, clarify. What do you want to complicate life for? And, and then I come to understand that really what, what it means, what for years they've come to understand what it means, is that we get these overly simplistic understandings. And, and it's just not that simple. And so in complicating the thinking, it's not confusing the thinking. It's simply trying to bring in more of the realities that are, are, that are played, more of the um, well, just different dynamics that, that are involved in a situation. So that, you know, uh, um, n no, we're not trying to make it more complicated. We're simply bringing in the honest complexities of the situation. But he said, you know, I'd like to sit down. And there's several of us, he says, who'd like to. There was another son of a, of a man. He was one of our titulaires, a nurse in charge of a clinic here, and he, he was killed before the genocide. And in a rather harrowing day, we moved his wife and, and children out of that area of northern Rwanda down uh, outside of Kigali. And he says, some of those sons who have survived the genocide want to talk with you. He says, it might not mean much to you, but we want to say thank you. And I said, oh, you only know how much it means to me. Well, can I call him on the phone? He said, and I said, sure, you know, everybody's got cell phones. So this one of the guys who survived, one of the sons of this head nurse who survived is a helicopter pilot in the Army here today. And uh, we talked on the phone for a few minutes. He said he'll come and see us at the transit lounge tomorrow as we're flying out tomorrow morning. But I look forward to sitting down and talking with these young, uh, many of them young professionals here in Rwanda who are, who are working to just try to sort out. He says, you maybe understand some things better than me because you were here. And I said, nah, I don't think I do. Maybe I understand certain things a little better and you understand other things better. And as we come together, you know, maybe we can help each other. And so it kind of gave me a new vision too, uh, a broader vision of what could happen with conversations here in Rwanda. Conversations that I know a lot of you would love to sit in on. So I think my last one went over 10 minutes, so we'll have to cut this one shorter. But uh, we fly in the morning, and I wanted to get that little visit on before we took off. Really appreciate those of you who are checking in with the blog. And um, any of you who'd like to leave a little comments or feedback, some of you have written a few emails, and that's been great. 
very few number of you, but I know life's busy in the U.S., but uh, a couple of words with just a couple of thoughts. I mean, thanks for, yeah, that's all right. I know you're grateful, so I'm not looking for that as much. It's just simply a few things that stick with you, a few trigger points perhaps, or a few things that link together with your life today, the life around you, and some of the things we're sharing from here. Those little links are what uh, really I'm really interested to hear. And so, thanks. From Rwanda, we are signing off.